Hey brother Hear me now Brother dog Know me Understand Welcome to the Sargasset Podcast. I'm Robbie Thigpen. I'm Francesca Elmer. And I am Mar Fernandez. And we are your hosts for today. And we are going to share with you the latest ideas and concepts about sargassum and sargassum beaching events, which have become an international challenge. Good morning, Hi, everyone. everyone. How, how's everybody doing today? I'm good. Good morning, guys. Nice, nice. Hello. Yeah. Well, um, I personally am very happy to have the uh, mother of my nephew back today, uh, Dr. Mar Fernandez. <laughs> Finally. With us again. We, we, we've, we've been missing her. <laughs> I haven't talked to her in quite a while, so I've been missing her a whole lot. So, uh, But she's been on holiday in Spain, uh, away from Germany for a while, and playing down at the beach with the family and visiting old friends, and I'm really jealous about that. Um, Correct. Trying to... And I, I think... I, Trying to refuel my energies. Fran, so, how is so the Mar, situation you... uh, in Mexico? Um, it's better. The water is still rather brown, but at least they have gotten rid of most of the very, like, decomposing parts on to- on the beach. So now it's just new stuff coming in and the brown water comes from the stuff that's actually in the water. Um, I've been chasing clear water um, lately. So this weekend we tried to go to Puerto Morelos. The water was a bit brown, but only for a few meters. So we actually went for a swim. And then yesterday we saw a picture on Facebook about the place that had clear water here in Playa. But it's it was like it would have probably been like an hour walk on the beach. So after half an hour walking towards that place, we gave up and just walked back home. Um, yeah, so it's kind <laughs> of hard to find a place to go swimming right now. Still, yeah. So yeah, um, maybe I should start introducing our guests since you've already heard them uh, talking a bit. So um, I will start by introducing Professor Ute Marx. Um, she's the professor at the, of medical engineering at Pforzheim University in Germany. Um, but she has spent some of her research time in Brisbane in Australia. And her teaching focuses on the subjects of technical sales and marketing, as well as natural science subjects such as molecular biophysics and metagenomics. Her research activities focus, among other things, on the question of how metabolic products in body fluids can provide information about the course of diseases and the success of therapy. So super interesting. And her interest in algae research started in 2005, uh, studying the metabolism of H2 producing algae. And I'm sure we will hear more later about um, what she did with uh, sargassum. And also with us today is John Rolls, and he is from Australia. So while it is very early in the morning for me, it's quite late in the evening for him. And he's a research fellow at the Institute for Molecular Bioscience at the University of Queensland. And together with (laughs) Professor Ben Hankamp, who can't be here today, he researched the economic potential of algae-generated products. He has over 35 years' experience in the design and construction of energy projects, including power generation and renewable fuels. His PhD was directed at the generation of Telka platform for economic and environmental assessments of renewable fuel production. And the person who's not here today is Professor Ben Hackamer. Uh, he's from the uh, Queensland Territory University, and he's the group leader of uh, bio-inspired design. I, I like all words with bio in it. Um, uh, but he's inspired, bio inspired design of solar biotechnology system and director of the Center of Solar and Biotechnology, as well as the founding director of Solar Biofuels Consortium. And I think that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today is, is biofuels. And, uh, and that's an important topic and an exciting topic to me. And uh, maybe we'll be able to get him back at another time when it's not quite so late for him. And, all, and, uh, and with that, let's, uh, let's, get, let's get things rolling. 
Yes, and to get things rolling, I have uh, the first question for both of you, Ute and, and John, and that is, uh, what is sargassum for you? So maybe I should start on this one. So sargassum for us, in the first place, um, it's actually a huge amount of biomass resource. Um, as um, John and Ben are studying, um, or re are researching, producing biofuels from algae. And um, for us, uh, biomass means that um, that is um, the material that uh, uses the abundantly available um, solar energy for us through biosynthesis to turn that into chemical energy. And this huge amount of chemical energy floating around in the Atlantic Ocean should be, should not go unused, should be utilized, especially as it causes so much damage to the environment, to people, to economics involved. And um, interestingly enough, the first time I've heard about that huge amount of biomass, the gas on, um, I was spending my research sabbatical in Ben Hankemer's group in Australia, working with John and Ben and um, studying ways to turn algae, in this case microalgae, into biofuels. And the first thing from John I've learned from John was that um, the front end bit of producing the biomass is the most, uh, most expensive bit of the whole process. And I immediately realized when I heard about the sargassum influx, I actually heard about it um, on the German news. While I was in Australia, I was listening to the German news every morning. So there, one morning in July, I was sitting there, sorry, morning, listening to the German news and learned about that huge amount of biomass in the Atlantic Ocean. And then I thought, hey, that could be the solution to our problem of the expensive front end of um, producing biofuels from algae. And um, yeah, let's see whether this is just a stupid idea or whether it actually works. And that is uh, where John comes into play um, with his expertise in modeling such processes. So what does it mean? A huge amount of biomass that we would like to utilize. Yes, from my perspective, uh, that, that's exactly where the, the, the revelation that Uta came up with in, in respect of the, the, the huge volume of this biomass that is the, the key, as so we'll probably discuss a little bit later, to the economics associated with fuel production. That's very cool. And yes, we do need a solution that uses this biomass because it, the Caribbean is suffering with all of it coming to our beaches and just decomposing and doing nothing with all that energy. Um, I'm always interested how people get to work on sargassum. Some people, they walk on the beach, they see the sargassum and then they're like, oh, we need to do something and they come up with solutions and they have never worked with algae before. And then there's other people, which I think you probably um, are part of, which are already working with algae. And then they see sargassum as, wow, this is this new super algae that is proliferating. Let's work with this algae instead of what we've been working on before. Um, so I assume you belong to the second group. And um, Ute already told us a little bit why you started working with it, but could you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, okay, all right. Well, how, how did I come to this point? I, I as, as an engineer, and I've been working in energy production systems for all of my career, uh, for 35 years, uh, and ultimately uh, the designing and, and building all kinds of things from uh, oil refineries to gas processing plants and, and uh, power stations. And uh, quite a few years ago now, I was, I was head of a major construction group in Australia that produced power stations. And part of that group, I had the capacity to actually send some people out and predict what the future was 
uh, was for energy and in particular how we're going to address renewable energy sources. And what we came back with from that was that the electricity system is pretty well technologically advanced. Uh, we have all the solutions that can decarbonise our electricity production. But fuel production, which is uh, around about 80% of the energy that's used by humanity is in the form of fuels. And our fuel production system is a long way off being decarbonised. And so after I retired from that career, I decided to uh, do research into, into uh, fuel production and how we can decarbonise fuel production. And that's how I became involved in the uh, Hank of a group. Uh, we uh, had a look at a couple of different fuel options. Like we've, we've looked at hydrogen, and hydrogen is a, is a great fuel option, but it has a number of technical problems in that it's very quite difficult to store and transport. And as a, just as an aside, I'm actually working on solutions to those problems uh, completely separate from what the work I do at the university. Uh, but so, so that's the problem we've got with hydrogen. And th then you look at other solutions such as uh, ethanol. And the problem with ethanol is that it competes directly with uh, uh, food production uh, using arable land. And, you know, the, the, as the world population increases, that's going to be at a premium. And you really can't have a fuel system that competes with food production. It just is not going to work for the future. And so from all that, we came to the, the final solution that we've derived is to develop systems or fuel production based on microalgae production. The problem with that is that after doing three years of research and my PhD in, in those fuel production systems, the cost of producing fuel from microalgae is around about $1.30 US to $1.40 US a litre. That's the, that's the X factory price. The actual price that you'll pay at the pump was considerably more than that because you have to add in, you know, retail margins and, and distribution costs, etc. So that's just not going to compete with fossil fuels. And so we then looked at alternatives. Well, what can we do as a solution to that? And the, the alternatives is you can get government to mandate the use of this fuel. Uh, we're not sure that that's going to happen in a an acceptable time frame. It probably will happen, but it will, probably won't happen for 10 years. And so the other alternative we looked at was uh, for the uh, co-production of more valuable products. So we produce fuel and we produce co-products. And uh, the more valuable products then offset the, the, the fuel production costs. And we're still working on that, as, as in the Hankama group, we're still working on that quite extensively. But then Uta came up with the idea, well, why don't we tap into the natural resource that's occurring in algae production, and that is with macroalgae, and, and in fact, uh, the sargassum blooms in the, in the Atlantic, uh, in the Caribbean, are, are a magnificent resource that should be used uh, for fuel production. Interesting. Thank you so much for that, um, <laughs> for your response. And I'll, um, I'd like to know a little bit about the, more about this solar biotechnology and what other kind of solutions you folks are working on. The the the, the um, center for solar biotechnology essentially is is trying to tap into photosynthesis for producing valuable products. Uh, ben Hankema founded the group um, about 10 years ago now, or a little bit more, uh, and uh, that's, that's what we're all about, producing uh, valuable products for humanity based on photosynthesis. I don't know, Uta, have you got any other things to add to that? Um, 
Well, um, I think uh, Ben provided us uh, with a vision and mission statement, and I think um, the question was also about what other solutions uh, Ben and his group is working on. And I think uh, Ben mentioned beside fuels, uh, of course, food, medicine, biomedical products, and economic services um, through the bio-inspired inspired solar driven technology. And, and ju just some examples of that. I mean, some of the things we're producing in algae range from just animal feeds, which is fairly simple. You're producing protein, so you can produce animal feeds. But we can we can go a lot further than that. Uh, we're we're working on a vaccine for prawn production. So uh, it's actually a prawn food, and by bioengineering the algae that produce that food, we can produce a a, a particular very specialised protein called VP28 uh, that is used to vaccinate prawns against the white spot virus. So you not only feed them, but you also prevent virus in the, in, in, as, a, as a porn food. There's other even more valuable products than that that we're producing um, uh, for human therapeutics, which the value of them can go up to extraordinary values, you know, a million dollars a gram uh, for stroke treatments and heart treatments, etc. Very cool. I mean, it, it actually has a lot of uh, different applications, as you as you said, like photosynthesis is the core. And then there's all these things that you can do with the products that uh, come out of that. So tell us yeah. a little bit more about making crude oil out of um, algae or in particular from sargassum. Like what type of processes do you have to go through? OK, well, the I guess the core process is is a thing called HDL, hydrothermal liquefaction, and it's essentially a pressure cooker. You you put uh, you you reduce the algae to a to a, a paste and you put it in the pressure cooker and it's uh, at around about two hundred atmospheres of pressure and three hundred fifty degrees Celsius, um, and you cook it for say 10, 15 minutes at that temperature and pressure, and uh, you therefore extract the, uh, the maximum amount. So you're not only extracting the oil content of the, of the algae, you're actually converting some of the carbohydrates and proteins into usable oil fractions. It's exactly what happens when, in the natural production of oil underground. For, for, for fossil fuels are formed in exactly the same way. And so uh, all the ad additional processes involved uh, in our proposal for, for doing this on board a ship uh, are more conventional, just materials handling. How do you harvest the algae off the water surface? How do you get it into the ship, store it, etc.? Yeah, that's, that's very true. Like uh, we talked to people and they said the, the drying process would take a lot of energy and if you have to dry it you have to think about how to do it without using much energy or using renewable energy. Um, so when reading up on how to make al fuel from algae I was kind of like shocked or, or surprised that a lot of the algae based fuel is actually produced on land. Well, for me, the, the advantage of making something from algae is that you don't need to use land. But with sargassum, you don't need to use land because the sargassum is actually growing on its own um, in the Atlantic. So what is the advantage of using sargassum compared to this land-based al algae to fuel production? And is there any other ocean-based algae that they're using to make fuel or is everything else made on land? Okay, so so in terms of the microalgae we're using, uh, you can use either a saline or non-saline strains of algae or micro, for microalgae production. Uh, and w all of our work has been based on the fact that you use saline strains simply because they're so much... It, it, it frees up the possibilities much more than using fresh water. Uh, and... Although we haven't investigated production of microalgae 
on water, <coughs> we we uh, we have using saline strains doing it in ponds, and and that's where all of our our work has been to date until we we uh, we started to work with the sargassum. Uta, have you got any other? Yes, I think I, I would like to answer the second part of the question. So um, the second part was, I think, are there other um, ocean algae blooms um, that are utilized uh, to produce um, biofuels? I think that was the question, wasn't it? Mm, yes. Okay, so um, I think... Um, um, yeah, you probably heard the term and you might not like it a lot because it sounds a little bit positive, but the uh, sargassum blooms are often referred to as golden tides and uh, there are also green tides and green tides are produced or caused by the algae alba and um, they, are, they also occur around the world, mainly in the Yellow Sea, but also in other areas of the world and Alva actually is used um, and harvested for biofuel production and mainly for biodiesel, bioethanol and biogas. And I think from what I've read up is uh, the main focus is mainly feedstock for biogas production. But it's also used as feedstock for um, producing bioplastics um, and um, what was the other thing? Um, or, for example, as a raw material for paper making. But I think wow. the, main, the main use is um, pizza for paper gas. But it's alpha, the, the green stuff, it looks like lettuce. It's also called sea lettuce. And actually, I think it's mixed in with the sargassum that's floating around in the Caribbean. Yes, we sometimes see a little Ulva? bit of Ulva. Yeah, Ulva. Neat. Um, so that is uh, the algae strain from the ocean area, the strain I'm aware of that's also used for biofuel production. Um, neat. In your study, I've you heard placed about the, it uh, in China. That's true. China, um, the Yellow Sea, I think that's where it mainly occurs, uh, the blooms of the Alba. Ulva. Nice. Thank you. I, I didn't know there was a Chinese connection. Um, and we certainly have a Brazilian connection, too. And um, you, you place a ship off the coast of Brazil uh, with some of this, this technology to test out. So why, why did you choose that location? And could you bring it down here to the Caribbean where we really, really, really need it bad? Well, well the, the reality is the ship can operate anywhere. We, we selected uh, – the, the important thing is – uh, we, we don't have the capacity to fully refine the fuel on board the ship. It's just impossible to do all of that processing on board a ship. And so we're doing the basic processing on, on the ship, the HDL process, and that separates and produces essentially a bio-crude oil. And then we have to take the ship to a location where it can be refined. And so... The, the real essence is, can you have a refinery uh, within reasonable proximity of one of the algae blooms? And that's the only criteria you need to look for. So you both need proximity to refineries and proximity to the algae blooms Very nice. I, I'd like to go ahead and volunteer the uh, the uh, refineries in Louisiana to uh, to 
to to to work with your project. And I'll um you know, it's kinda of all in the same vicinity. Louisiana's not that far from the Yucatan Peninsula. And I'll get straight across the ocean. And uh heck there may be a, and I think Mexico's probably got a uh refinery there on the Gulf somewhere. I think that there's a um a, a refinery in Tabasco. Well, Robbie, if they pick it up um, by Brazil, it may never come to Mexico if they pick up enough of it, because that's where the sargassum starts to come into the Caribbean. That's true as well. They also have refineries in uh, Trinidad. Um, and in fact, the, the major refinery, which was an employer of over a thousand people, has just recently closed up in Trinidad. And, you know, maybe an opportunity like this to to keep at least part of that refinery operational and create the onshore jobs associated with refining fuel. Exactly. So and that is, that's Trinidad, exactly where my next question is going. Like, how many jobs do you think you can create uh, with this kind of new uh, industry and new approach to creating uh, fuels, and then how much sargassum do you think each of those ships could harvest? Like, would you need like ten ships, or would you need a hundred thousand ships? Like, what's the what's the magnitude of of this? Well, there, there's a a number of elements to that. Uh, okay, so so we've got a base case that we've identified in our in our research, and we've tried to be as conservative as we as we can with regard to the modelling of these things. And in the base case scenario, we've got a harvest rate. We, we talk about a harvest efficiency. So it's the proportion of time that the ship actually is harvesting its full capacity of, of algae collection. And uh, based on that, uh, the, the percentages we're using for that is, for our base case, is 10%. So 10% of the time we'll actually be harvesting algae. So that's a fairly conservative position, we think. So given that base case, we should be able, the, the ship, the cost of producing the ship is around about 38 million US dollars. That's buying a second-hand uh, small uh, 10, 12,000 tonne oil tanker and converting it to the production of, of fuel on board or crude oil on board. Uh, it will probably ultimately employ on each ship around about 20 people. So there'll be the normal ship's crew plus there'll be all the production uh, operations people associated, associated with the production of the, the crude oil. And each ship should be able to produce around about a 300,000 barrels of oil a year, which is fairly significant production level. Um, and, and in doing so, you, you have to harvest around about 630,000 tonnes of algae a year. Now, they're the numbers, and then you can multiply those numbers by any number, you, by any number of ships you like, and that gives you your total fuel production. Uh, but if, if, if extrapolating this out, say a, a country like, say, Barbados, for, running a fleet of maybe five to ten of these ships could entirely produce their, their liquid fuel uh, requirements completely renewably. We actually had a guest on our podcast a few weeks ago from Barbados who's doing research there and she has the idea of using sargassum and the wastewater from rum distilleries to make um, biogas fuel for cars and she said if they use all the sargassum in their EEZ they can fuel all the cars in, in their country as well. Yeah, that's the energy. The, the, the energy content is there. It's just a matter of how you, how most effectively you use it. Um, <laughs> in terms of the conservative, you know, say for instance, some of the things that we've included in our conservative estimates of how this would work are uh, part of the HDL process that we described before. 
the HTL produces um, a number of products. There's some gas that's produced as part of the HTL. There's an aqueous portion. There's a, a an oil portion, and there's a solid portion that comes out of the HTL process. Now, what we'll be doing on board the ship is is putting that solid portion into a digester, producing the gas that we require, which could be used for powering the process. But in addition to that, the, the digestate that's left after that digestion is a really uh, strong, very good fertiliser, high nutrient fertiliser. And we'll be collecting that on board the ship and transporting it to the port. And at this point in time, in terms of the economics, we haven't even accounted for the value of that product. So there's a lot of additional spin-off uh, yeah. commercial opportunities that could be generated from this. That's really cool. It, 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 I think that's a really important point. Highlight getting nitrogen and phosphorus, especially back from the sea to land in a controlled way. I think that's nowadays very important. Now, we, we don't know how you can package market that that's that wasn't the primary focus of our research, but but you'd have to believe that there's some commercial value to that. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure you'll figure it out when the time comes. And I'll, um, you, you, uh, well, you know, you, you, yeah, I have no doubt about that. Yeah, um, I, and, and, you know, we, we did the analysis based on uh, an oil price of $55 a barrel, and we were coming up with a profitable uh, solution, making 18% internal rate of return at $55 a barrel. And we didn't even account for all these other commercial opportunities. Uh, the price of oil now is over seventy dollars a barrel. That's all all opportunity profit. Yes, so, sounds very lucrative. Wow. Well, now if we, if we can do a great, uh, if we can do, introduce a profitable industry and at the same time clean up the ocean, what a what a great outcome. Yeah, I don't have forty million dollars to get a boat, but that sounds like something people <laughs> with money should be doing. <laughs> yeah, or governments, or governments, any of the Caribbean nation governments. Mm -hmm. It's a, it seems really sensible solution to some of their problems. Yes, and the Caribbean. A few years ago, they came up with a number of how much they actually spend for cleaning up the beaches, and it's 120 millions they spend each year to clean up the beaches from sargassum. So for that money, you can pretty much buy three of these boats and give people jobs and have a revenue stream. Yeah, yeah, and again, the the the. The associated revenue with for the cleanup also hasn't been accounted for in our in our costings at all. Yeah. Now let me let me throw a question out there. You you um, you're talking about how much fuel and and whatnot you could generate by one of these boats, and you said a, a, a number, uh, uh, I guess, weight of how much sargassum that you could use. What was that number again? Six hundred thirty thousand tons. Uh, this may per ship. Yeah, okay, per, yeah. per ship per year. Okay, this this may just show my ignorance year, right yeah. here. But um, how many cubic meters is that? Of, of you know, do you have? Did, was that part of your uh, calculations? Um, no, 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 not really. We didn't value it. <laughs> we didn't. We didn't look at it in terms of cubic meters. Um, so we, we do have some numbers with regard to its density on surface, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. And I think I did calculate it in one case because I found a paper um, measuring the amount of sargassum on the beach in cubic meters, and I tried to recalculate it and came up with a sensitive number, but I don't have it out of the top of my head. Yeah. I, I, so maybe I can provide you with that number later on. Yeah, I, I think if you're pitching this to... Um, to any countries and stuff like that, that might be a very useful 
uh, figure to have. We, we, we can take care of, you know, 30 yeah. football pitches a month, you know, or a week. Um, that, 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 that could be a, 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 yeah. a eye opening way to describe what you're doing. In the, in the news and stuff, they always talk about tons and not often about cubic meters of sargassum. So even the people who pick it up at the beach, they talk about tons rather than cubic meters. One of the concerns that could be raised is that are we going to actually um, go, go too far and remove all the sargassum, which we certainly don't want to do. But, but Uta, I think uh, you've got some numbers with regard to the total volume of sargassum that's in the ocean at any point in time. Well, there was the number given of the um, 20 million tons. Um, that was a figure uh, from a um, paper in Science, I think, in June, which was a value in June 2018. 20 million tons, yes. tons of sargassum. So, so we could have a fleet of 10 ships, and and they wouldn't even you'd be, be harvesting a, a third of this the, the total volume. Yeah, well, well, my point was um, when people look out at the sea and they see a raft of this sargassum coming, that that was kind of what, what I was getting at. That might be a good way to describe it, you know, um, to these governments. Hey, this is this is what we're going. This is how many you know square meters of uh, surface area we're going to keep off your beach. Yeah. I, I think yeah. I think the value we had in our paper was was three and a half kilos per square meter, wasn't it? Or, um, hang on a second. I, I think I recall that number, three and a half kilos a square meter. So 630 tons, thousand tons is a lot of square meters. Oh, I bet it is. Um, if you go to their paper in the discussion, they actually say if you have 10 boats, um, how many square kilometers of beach um, you would um, save from getting um, inundated by sargassum. So I think that's a really useful number. Yeah. Well, I, I was just suggesting that as a way to to for to make it easier for people to visualize, lay laypersons to visualize. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, really interesting. Uh, guys, I'm sorry, but I have to leave. So, um, Uta and John, it was really interesting to meet you, and I hope to catch up with you in the future, maybe to collaborate Thank on you. some future projects. And Fran and Robbie, I hope it's okay that I leave you two to do the wrap-up. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Lovely to see yes. you again. It's, it seems like it's been ages. And also have a good afternoon, and, <laughs> and please greet your family for us. I have a last question for you guys. So um, this boat and the crude oil we talked about, this is still only theory right now. Like you came up with how much it will cost, how much revenue you, you would make. Um, are there any plans to make this ship reality? Do you have any takers yet to actually build the ship or do you still need people to actually buy into this? Is we still need people to actually buy into this, <laughs> but I think, um, as you have realized from our discussion so far, we were very conservative in calculating um, the numbers and the revenue that would be possible, uh, the rate of return that would be possible. So we have, from our from our best research, and let's let's call it or from our model, we have shown that the process is viable and. Um, Wherever there were so, some uncertainties in the process, we have allocated and allowed for extra money to make sure that there are margins available to correct for any problems that occur while we are going along. And um, also, as uh, John has pointed out, the harvest efficiency is being only 10%, which is also quite conservative. Um, However, to move on from, from the model to, to a reality, to making this reality, of course, we would like to get a ship running, learning on the way, gaining experience, um, improving the process on the way while collecting sargassum and processing it in, into bio crude. So for that, um, sponsors, of course, would be very helpful. <laughs> and um, however, we also thought about um, 
it might be quite a challenge finding sponsors because it will be definitely a multi-country endeavor. It can't be just one government, and that you know, brings me back to your slogan, marine conservation without borders. So it has to be um, a multi-country endeavor, and you uh, probably have to convince more than just one government um, to work together to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. And did you think about like getting like angel investors or philanthropy investors um, for this type of thing uh, for like a startup or something, or is it more something that governments sh um, will likely be interested in? Yeah, well, pr probably, probably we think uh, because because it's a, an international resource, we probably have to initiate this through through governments of whichever government you pick who's who's who's, who's interested and and is strongly affected. So I think it could start from there. And the, the interesting thing also is in, in many of the Caribbean countries, the oil refining uh, facilities there are largely owned by the. Um, the, the national governments, and so they already have a means whereby they can facilitate the the process. They already have that in their portfolio of activities, and we think that's probably the best place to start with with governments. But we need to get governments interested, of course. Yes. Yeah, that, that that can be a difficult. So we're hoping that this this this, this, this uh, <laughs> podcast may uh, may assist us in in getting to those governments and and <clears throat> flagging up that this is a, this is far from a, a problem. It's an opportunity that they should be capturing. Yeah, yeah well, there's a lot of yeah, governments out there. Sure. Uh, the um, energy cost. For a lot of these places, that they're dependent on dirty, I mean, really dirty diesel for for electricity in a lot of places. Yeah. And, um, and you know, fuel is what it takes to do everything. There, there's no, really, a lot of alternatives. A couple of uh, countries in Mesoamerica have some dams, but the majority of the fuel in a lot of these places, especially the island nations, are, are generated by, by fossil fuels. And, um, and it's very expensive. And, and important. Yeah, exactly. Imported. And all. Yeah, and, it's, um, it's imported and the, the money is flowing straight out of their economy. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and this gives them the opportunity of retaining all of that, all of those costs or all of that price within their own own economy. It's, it's, a, it's a good solution. Yeah. You know, um, CARICOM might be a group you want to talk to. I'll, uh, when, I, when I email you, I, I don't really have any direct contacts there, but it's a organization of caribbean states and all and and uh, they're a pretty strong organization and that that might be a place for you to start i'll i'll include that in the email i'm going to send you later um Any, anything I anything you like to add to summarize uh, your work i'd like to add the number we were after beforehand and uh, which we had already actually stated in our paper correctly in the sense a fleet of 10 ships could collect 6.3 million tons of sargassum biomass per year, and that equals um, to a coastline of um, 640 kilometers uh, coastline per month that would be not inundated Ooh, by yeah. sargassum. That's a, that's a good, that's a good, that's a good, that's a good visualization of your project there. Yeah. yeah. And, so six and, kilometers of coastline per month um, could be cleaned or not not inundated um, if we collected six point three million tons of sargassum using ten ships. Yeah, th yeah, thank you. And That's at the same time, make a profit and employ people. Yes, yeah. and enrich the soil. More than two birds with one stone. Yeah, and enrich and and provide a fertilizer. Yeah, no, I, I, I who, think who could I, say no. Yeah, I, I think these tertiary <laughs> benefits that you, you haven't valued out are, are just exceptional. Yeah, and oh uh, yeah, well, well, that's that's awesome. And, I, and this is this is uh, Francisca gets on me because I say this just about every time. This has been a really exciting interview. Thank you guys, and I'll, um, and she says, oh, "Rob, you say that 
you say that every interview is is, is the most exciting interview, <laughs> and uh, but they all are to me. They they all very much so are, and uh, and this one was, was exciting to me as well. Um, but but I'm but I'm easy, you know. I I, uh, I like talking about new stuff and new technologies, and so so it's always exciting to me. And and uh, just want to thank you folks for joining us today, and um, and hopefully we'll be able to hear more about your work in the future. And, uh, and maybe we, you know, we, we'll be able to do something together and all. So thank you very much. Excellent. Th- thanks for the opportunity of, of appearing. It's been really good. Yeah. Thank yes. you so much. Okay. Yeah, thank you so well, much for I'm being looking here. Forward to your emails. Okay, well, we'll see you <laughs> yes. around. Thank you. Bye. Bye for now. Bye for now. So, Robbie, what, so, what do you, do you think? think? I thought this was really interesting, and actually a few years ago when I first heard that you can sargassum can also be a positive thing, people were talking to me about biofuel, but then later on I always heard how it's, oh, it's actually much harder to do than we thought. So hearing about this today and how how it's actually maybe not that hard and, and could be profitable was, was really, really good. Yeah, yeah, I, I just, I, I just think it's an amazing thing, and and turning this uh, issue into something useful, uh, you know, it's it, it's uh, along the lines of uh, of our our discussion with uh, Dr. Henri and from Barbados the other week, except at a wholly, completely different scale, and um, and you know, and, and it could prevent these beachings from even occurring if if um, you know there you got several ships out there looking for bunches that are about to break off and stuff. And, um, you know, prevention is, I think, would be a lot cheaper than the cure. So I, I think this is an amazing project. Yes. I, I think Legina also wants to prevent the beaching in the first place, but maybe closer to shore to Barbados. And she's mostly focusing on how to make a you know, good biofuel and hasn't really worked on, on the where to get the sargassum from part because other people in Barbados are working on it. But this is kind of an all-round solution that that looks at both, okay, can we collect it and can we make um, a product out of it and, and actually multiple products out of it. So it is really, really cool. And and yeah, I don't know events. if it would prevent beaching. Yeah, I don't know if it would prevent it completely, because I think it, it's hard to collect all the sargassum. Well, well, maybe, and they also said they yeah, want to well, leave. Perhaps I should have said leave reduce. some to have that habitat out there. Yeah, but yeah, it would definitely reduce it. And you know, having lived here now and also in South Caicos. There are certain levels of sargassum arriving on the beach, which are okay and actually can be positive for the beach. Um, but then once it starts piling up so fast that you cannot take care of it, that's when it becomes really, really negative. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well this has been an, another great interview, folks. We, uh, we appreciate you joining us today i think this is the uh biggest spread we've had from being around the world with uh, queensland and germany and uh, playa and uh, and of course right here in the low country of south carolina and oh uh, and uh you know we know you could have been anywhere on the planet today and just like all of us are but you you decided to spend a little time with us and we really appreciate it and uh we look forward to seeing you next week and in the meantime just have a have a really great everything thank you so much Yes, thank you everyone and have a good week. Thank you for tuning in today and learning with us from our guests. If you want more information about what our guests talk about today, then please check our show notes for links and information in our archives. And don't forget to like and share our podcast with your friends. If you enjoyed our podcast, please consider supporting us financially by becoming a Patreon. 
For as little as $1 per month, you can support us and get the exclusive benefit of submitting questions for our interviewees before the interview. The Sargasm Podcast is produced by Marine Conservation Without Borders and is made possible with financial support from Seafields. It is produced by Marcel Van de Camp, Lauren Blankenship, Cleo Maridakas, Francisca Elmer, and Eloise Lopez, and is hosted by Robbie Thigpan, Francesca Elmer, Mar Fernandez, Florence Menez, Cleo Maridakas, and Paula Diaz. We will be back next week with another exciting guest. The music of this podcast is from the song Demo Prey by Drizzle, the Roadrunner, an artist from Roatan. Follow him on Spotify or YouTube for more music. But for now, here is the full song Demo Prey. Hey, brother. Hear me now. Brother dog, know me, understand. Now for them no one be see we get nothing, that's why they my free and always front and star. Now for them no one be see we get nothing, that's why they my free. Now for them my free, free they my free. They my free, me no gain progress, now for them my free. They my free, me no gain success, now for them my free. They my free, me no gain progress, not for them my free They my free, me no reap success, so me tell them ya Rap is my money, no take that, only if it come from jail, I'll accept that Not for them, I put the trust in and give me set back Yo, select that, me lamp pull up that, tell some wicked that But my thing no fair them, anytime them cheat and chat, me no hear them Me dash up Hot so for the queer them Me dash a few hearts so tell them where them Now for them a free yeah. They my free me no gain progress Now for them a free They my free me no reap success So me tell them yeah Yes me know me have a lot of fake friends But me never woulda taught me woulda have fake family yeah. So me tell them straight me no trust them Me no trust you and me no trust him Fake friend lost, lost bad mind, mind in a real life star Me no rate that star, me no rate that uh, Me real for me what that Boss a million shot in a real life Real, real, real life Now for them a free Them a free, me no gain progress Now for them a free Them a free, me no reap success Now for them a free Them a free, me no gain progress Now for them a free Success to me tell you yeah. Life, but they my hate and grudge and creep on mine. They my move like Judas. They my move like Judas. Plus, everybody have a life to live. So, when they give one rash clock, who I try to judge me. Let them chip and chat to what them want to say. Cause none of them out there. Not be now, for them are free. Yeah. They my free me. No gain progress. Now, for them are free. They my free me. No rape success. Now for them I'm free